things. So, so here I have a bit of a forward-looking talk, like a bit of hand wavy, but, but, but I am actually uh, excited by, the, by these things here. So it's going, we are going to dive a bit into ephemeral subnets, which with this recursion that IPC has that I was talking about that we presented in different talks is definitely the distinguishing feature of IPC. Uh, so, and we'll try to see at least as a thought experiment how this could lead to fully on-chain games. And we'll start from, uh, from like simple ones like board games and, and card games. So this is, the, this is the, like the tree that we showed in many presentations, right? And the idea here is that like you scale and like you're a bit specializing. So, so L1 is a rather general purpose than one, be it Filecoin or some other one. And then as you go down, you're like specializing more and more, right? So you can imagine that you have an L2 gaming submit, which is almost like a gaming lobby. So, so, so you are entering with your PlayStation 5, and then you're entering this lobby, and then you're picking some players to play with, and then you're spawning subnets below. So basically, if we zoom in, this game A subnet can be what we call ephemeral subnets. Like in Juan's talk, you don't need, this doesn't need to be L3, this can be L5 or whatever, right? In my example, it's L3. So this means that the subnet lives for the duration of the game itself. So this is the main point of an ephemeral subnet, right? And in limit, what we can offer and what we others, like conceptually what we can offer, not what, what we can offer today, but conceptually what we can offer with IPC is that players can be validators themselves. So basically, when you spawn a game, you would spawn a game where like, there are several players and this virtual gaming field, virtual table, if you're playing board and card games, is actually among the players themselves. And then you play for a bit, right? So you get certain privacy aspects for free because like, the whole gameplay is in the subnet, right? So it's not visible necessarily to all uh, other nodes in the big network, certainly not on L1 and not even on L2. But the effects are persisted. So if you play in some tokens, like the balances of the tokens are persisted on L2. And basically, I don't know, the, we'll have some examples. So, so we'll dive into this. So this is how it's supposed to be working on some days. So you have players, and they're running, for example, browsers or even mobile phones in future, right? But let's focus on browsers. And basically, the IPC subnet runs validators in each of these browsers. And then you have this, like, there is no centralized server. Like normally in online gaming, these guys would connect to a central server and then basically you would maintain the state necessary for the game at this central server, but this doesn't exist anymore. So this really decentralized among the player themselves. And this particular subnet, if it's ephemeral, it would just last for the lifetime of the game. So let's go through some examples. So, so actually necessary ingredients. So what do we, what technical problems do we need to solve to get here, right? So, Currently, in IPC, we are using uh, off-the-shelf consensus, which has its own trust assumption, so you can tolerate a threshold of Byzantine validators, so like a third, but you would need to tailor, like in certain cases, you would need to tailor the assumptions of consensus to match the assumptions of the game. And this is why, in our architecture, we want to have like modular and flexible consensus protocols so we can actually do this, right? So you definitely need some sources of randomness to, I don't know, roll dices, shuffle cards and so on, but then you can use like existing solutions for this. And then depending on the difficulty of your problem, you might be looking sometimes, but not always. I'll try to sketch how for some simpler games, we don't need necessarily all the heavyweight artillery of, of cryptography, like zero knowledge proofs and mu secure multi-party computation to, to actually implement these games. But sometimes you would need it, right? For more co complex games, you would actually need it. And what's interesting from the distributed computing perspective is you need to tolerate the cases of rage quitting, right? So everyone who played online games knows rage quitting, when the opponent actually doesn't like the outcome of the game, it just interrupts the game and leaves, right? So there we can actually use some existing approaches to basically like closing, for example, like learning from closing payment channels and like keeping the state on with which we can close if this happens, but there is more research needed here, right? So basically this problem is linked to fault tolerance in distributed computing. Okay, so a bit more concretely. So this is a warm-up example, and Juan also talked about chess in his, in his case. So this is relatively simple, and even today on IPC, we are not miles away from implementing this. Why? Because you can spawn a subnet among two players, 
and use the subnet itself for like moves and chat, for example. So, so you can have this on a subnet, you have the infrastructure for this. And since like the latencies are amenable to this, right? Because these are two humans playing, hopefully, two humans playing chess. So basically there is inherent latency in like how we as human process information. And this matches, for example, what we already, like the latencies that we already have uh, in Fender Mint IPC. And essentially, we then keep scores, ELOs, reputation, whatever, tournament information, metadata on L2. And essentially what we would need conceptually for IPC to do it today, we need to make sure that these rage quits are implemented properly. And we can do it, I think, leveraging these two-party state channel approaches. Where it gets more interesting is in a game like Begemon, which is still public state. So like in chess, the state in Begemon is public. So this makes this game simpler than some other ones. But you need to implement dice rolling. So this is the, so you need some sources of randomness. And of course, like L3 can draw randomness from L2, right? And this is very relatively simple. So you can have verifiable random functions that, that, that actually do this. And then Begemon is usually played in money. And also chess sometimes, but Begemon is typically played in money. So we are going towards more interesting cases where like there is token exchange per, per hand and per game. And we can basically Again, use IPC subnets for this. I don't think we need much more than like handling these rage quit proofs to, to actually get there. And basically getting to the title of the talk, this is, a, this is a more complex game, right? So why is it more complex? Because the state of the game is not public. Like if I see my cards, I, I should be the only one who's, who sees my cards, like unlike Inchest and Begemon. And like you need to implement, like more, you need more heavyweight cryptography to actually implement this one. So there are some nice ideas, actually mental poker, uh, like prior to proliferation of internet, there is this paper by RSA authors, so Shamir, Rivest, and Adleman. It's not called online poker because it's like 1979. But actually, the, this is a nice paper that explains that the problem is actually unsolvable. This is the first result of the paper, and the second result of the paper, it gives a nice practical property protocol to actually implement, for, for the implementation, so it's a great paper. And you can use some sorts of commutative encryption that are not as secure as block ciphers, but like there is some cryptography that can help here. For, for example, card shuffling and so on. And natively, IPC subnet proof of stake can model player stakes. So this is nice. So, you know, it, it, IPC is amenable to, the, to this use case in some sense, right? What we would not need to do to do it in IPC today, except like apart from these rage quit proofs, is maybe use L2 as, as offline trusted third party. So offline trusted third party is the trusted third party that's not used all the time in the protocol, but just if somebody tries to cheat, for example, not commit to the results of the game and leaves the game, then we might use uh, fraud proof withdrawal periods like they, they use it in, in optimistic rollups or something like that. Like we might use it in general in IPC to actually counteract this problem. So this means that, for example, if you think about fraud proofs, in general, they might need to be tailored to what the application is actually doing. So currently, the whole, like whoever develops these protocols, we are looking mostly into general purpose computation. But what I'm claiming here is that these proofs might be needed to be more application aware. And the gameplay itself might need more tailored solutions. Yeah, so there are some challenges that are not that are inherent, so I would say, online. So in online poker, for example, what's the problem? And for any game that has more than two players. So the problem is if you have three players or more, I can run two players and basically play, play against George. So if I play poker, I will see two hands at the same time. And of course, this is, this is not good for, for like the, the third party here. So here, this, this is actually a big problem even in, in, in online gaming, centralized online gaming today. But how we can approach this is basically L2 can maintain identities, so addresses that are depositing tokens are identities. And then you can almost use, you can think of using chain analysis or something to figure out which accounts are coupled and basically detect if some accounts are correlated, right? So it's forward looking, again, I'm not saying we can implement this today, but, but like nothing seems unimplementable here and that's nice. And this consensus assumption, so we will need consensus protocols that can react on specific, like that can be adjusted with specific gaming, game 
assumptions rather than off the shelf, like third of players can be malicious. I mean, in practice, this is not going to fly necessarily for, for a game like poker. Right? So I guess we as a, 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 as a IPC team, we need to decide whether we want to like, collaborate with teams that will develop such games. But this shows you just briefly, like argues briefly why completely on-chain on gaming with tables and, and basically playing fields distributed among uh, participants themselves is not infeasible in and it's actually feasible with IPC. Yep, that's it.